Well, today marks the beginning of this Christian season of the year called Advent. Uh, Advent means to come toward. Now, we don't do a whole lot in Advent, and so you, that's recognizable when the pastor's daughter says, looks at the Advent wreath that's on the table and says, Dad, are we celebrating Hanukkah? Uh, no, we're celebrating Advent. <laughs> and so that's why we have an Advent wreath there. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that Advent wreath later on in this message series. But Advent is this season. Advent is a word that means to come toward. So it's the season of the Christian year when we celebrate that Jesus is coming near. And as we celebrate that truth uh, of Christmas, I mean, when we celebrate that truth of Christmas, we're celebrating that Jesus is coming near every single year at this Christmas time. So for the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Day, we celebrate that Jesus is coming. So we place ourselves back in time as we celebrate that Jesus is about to come as a baby in Bethlehem. But in Advent, we also celebrate that today, in 2018, we still await the coming of Jesus as we look forward to the day when Jesus will return. So Advent celebrates not only that Jesus came on Christmas Day, way back in the first century, but also that he's going to come again in the future. Not only is he, did he come as a baby in Bethlehem, as the Savior who died on the cross to take away our sins and to resurrect us to new life, but also Advent celebrates that Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, what does that mean? When he comes again, he will resurrect the dead. He will do away with, with death altogether. <coughs> so death and sin will be finally and fully defeated. He will make all things new. We will live with Jesus face to face in a new heaven, a new earth. And, and that second coming is really worth celebrating just as much as we celebrate Christmas Day, just as much as we celebrate that first coming on that first Christmas Day. See, our celebration of Advent really has two meanings then. So one is pretty obvious as we, we wait to unwrap the, the baby in swaddling cloths, you know, but also the, the second part of Advent is a little bit deeper that we kind of have to unwrap it a little bit to get to the real meaning, which is, that uh, the real gift is not just a baby in a manger, it's the return of our Savior. The real gift of Advent is not just a baby in a manger, but the return of our Savior. And so this Advent message series we're, we're starting today is called Unwrapped, and the goal for this message series is to look at our Christmas celebrations that we have and find out what they really mean, unwrap them a bit, and figure out what they're all about. Because in our celebration of Christmas, we celebrate Christmas with many traditions, that we may not realize have multiple meanings. So we celebrate with gifts and with trees and with candy canes and with Santa Claus and with Christmas lights. But all of those things actually are more than meets the eye. And they have a deeper, richer, hidden meaning to them that we're going to unwrap together. And as we unwrap these traditions, your Christmas season, I believe, will become even better because it'll be like we're unwrapping a new gift every Sunday when we get together for you. Who doesn't like unwrapping gifts? So today we're going to kick off this Unwrapped series by talking about that very thing, unwrapping gifts. Now, there are lots of gift-giving traditions in Christmas. Uh, of course, the main one is opening presents around a Christmas tree on Christmas morning, perhaps receiving gifts from a stocking that was hung by the chimney with care. You know, when I was a, a kid growing up, I was always kind of curious why the gifts that my neighbor received in his stocking hung by the chimney with care always seemed to include uh, more expensive things than my stocking <laughs> did. You know, he got uh, Game Boy video games. It shows me my age. And I got, I got gum. And, uh, but, you know, I was always really excited to just pull out what's in the stocking and see what was there because that was the exciting part was just unwrapping those gifts. And also in my family growing up, my sister and I used to always get to open uh, one present on Christmas Eve. But it was a very specific gift that my parents had, had picked out. And Almost always, it seems like in my memory, and my memory is going to be bad most of the time, but in my memory, I always remember getting new pajamas. You know, that way, when we're taking photos around the Christmas tree the next morning, we all look good for the photos. And now, now the tradition at our house is not new pajamas on Christmas Eve, but we do still kind of open a, a gift on Christmas Eve, and it's usually instead my wife has coordinated our Christmas outfits for the Christmas Eve worship <laughs> service. And so I'll get a new shirt that I'm told to wear on Christmas Eve, and the kids will often get some new clothes, and so that we can take some pictures at church later that evening. Now, I don't know what your gift-giving traditions are. I know you have to have some because pretty much you can't celebrate Christmas without giving gifts in some way, right? Now, some families 
unwrap all their gifts on Christmas Eve. I know some families did that. Some some people now celebrate with secret Santas. A lot of families now are doing that to try to kind of minimize how crazy Christmas giving is. So everyone draws names and you just pick for one, you just buy gifts for one person. Now, not everyone's gift giving celebrations and traditions are exactly the same, but no Christmas celebration would be complete without gift giving. So where does this thing come from? Because it's not really written necessarily in the biblical story. And and why do we do this gift-giving stuff? So I want to unwrap this tradition a little bit with you today. Why do we celebrate Christmas with gift-giving? Well, the first is because of a charity case, because of St. Nicholas. Now, one reason we give gifts at Christmas time is because we follow in the tradition of St. Nicholas. Now, St. Nicholas, if you don't know, is a Greek bishop who was a leader in the church in ancient Greece in the 4th century. That's way back in the 300s, okay? He was a follower of Jesus in Greece, and he graciously gave and generously gave to families who were in need, and he did that anonymously in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to go too much more into St. Nicholas today, because actually we're going to, we are devoting an entire message to that to St. Nick later on in this unwrapped message series in the coming weeks. But many people today give just because of the influence and the tradition of St. Nicholas from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But even though that's a Hundreds of years old tradition, I mean, St. Nick lived 1,700 years ago. That's still not the oldest example of gift giving that we see around Christmas time, which leads us to number two, which is we give because of a baby shower, because of the wise men. Now, another reason we give gifts at Christmas time is because we follow in this tradition of the wise men. And I want to read to you their story in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Matthew writes, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. During the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. <clears throat> then Herod came and called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So at the birth of Jesus, the the Magi, or the wise men that they're called, gave gifts. And I would think of this as sort of like a baby shower, right? When a couple is expecting a baby, then you bring gifts. Or when you go to the hospital to meet a new baby that's been born, you bring a gift. Or when you meet the child at home, after they come home from the hospital, you bring a gift. It's just similar to what the wise men did here. Uh, Because you never show up to the birth of a baby, especially the birth of a baby that you believe one day will be king, without a gift. You don't show up empty-handed. So at Christmas, we remember that Jesus, that baby, is actually a king, and we shower him with gifts. He's a king who is worthy of our worship, which means he's worthy of our gifts as well. He's worthy of our devotion. He's worthy of our best gifts. Now, some people today have taken this tradition of the wise men a step further, and they have created their own family tradition from this wise men tradition. They use the example set by the wise men as a model and as a guide for their own gift giving in their own families. So in other words, they don't go crazy into at Christmas time with all the buying of obscene amounts of gifts for their families. They don't let themselves go into massive amounts of, of credit card debt over the Christmas season for buying Christmas presents for their two year old. You know, in fact, I just want to kind of take a step back from all the crazy Christmas spending for just a moment and especially the going into debt at Christmas, because I think how ridiculous that is that we would do that at Christmas time when you think about the meaning of Christmas. When you think about that Jesus has come, God has come to save us, 
He has come to pay the penalty for our sins and to free us from bondage. So why, why would we celebrate that gift of freedom and salvation by putting ourselves back into the bondage of debt? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. But to avoid some of this overspending and overbuying, some families have adopted what I'm calling the wise men's guide to giving, which is this. Three gifts is all you get. If three gifts is good enough for Jesus, three gifts are good enough for you. <laughs> and so, you know, we give gifts at Christmas because the wise men gave gifts in the Christmas story that we find in the Bible. But the third reason we give gifts at Christmas is because of a birthday, of Jesus' birthday. Now, in our culture, of course, birthdays are celebrated with gift giving. And so we celebrate Jesus' birthday with giving gifts. Now, some families of, of young children have taken this birthday tradition a step farther on Christmas, and they will bake a special happy birthday Jesus birthday cake. Have you seen this before? And it's, got, it's filled with meaning. Even the layers of the cake have different colors. You can tell a, a, a lot of the story of Jesus and the gospel from that happy birthday Jesus cake. They will sing happy birthday to Jesus on Christmas Day before they cut and eat the cake, all to remind one another that this Christmas celebration is about Jesus' birthday. But since, of course, we can't give gifts directly to Jesus, you know, he's ascended into heaven by now, so we give gifts in honor of him to one another, which is really great, <coughs> as long as, as long as we remember that it's Jesus' birthday, not our own, right? Because that can be kind of confusing to us, I think. Just think about that. Uh, whenever, when do you ever go to someone else's birthday party and you get gifts? Right? That, that just doesn't happen. Now, we know that sometimes it's difficult for young kids to grasp that concept, and so when they go to birthday parties, you know, they think that they're supposed to get gifts too, no matter whose birthday it is. And maybe you've been the parent at one point that enabled that kind of messed up mind, mindset of your child, where you're like, are bringing gifts for your own child to somebody else's birthday because you just don't want to have to deal with the crying kids and they don't get gifts. I don't know. But we're all old enough now to understand that Christmas is not your birthday. In fact, I just want to make that really clear just in case someone here is still behaving like a spoiled, rotten child on Christmas when it comes to their Christmas lists. That Christmas is not your birthday. It's not my birthday. It's not your birthday. So because it's not your birthday, you don't really need to make a list of things that you want to get. Instead, maybe you need to make a list of things that you want to give. Now, we try this exercise over and over with our own kids, it's a difficult exercise to do because it, it bucks against the norm of our culture that to make lists of what we want to give instead of make li making lists of what we want to get. Maybe this Christmas season, though, you need to make lists of what you want to get other people, what you want to give to other people, not what you yourself want to receive. Uh, you need, if if Christmas, Christmas is about celebrating Jesus' birthday, and if that's the case then maybe we need to stop and consider just a little bit longer, what does Jesus want for his birthday? What does Jesus want for his birthday? How can we honor him with our gift giving and his mission with our gift giving? So I want to show you a video now that talks about this idea to the next level.
inspiring this Christmas season to change the world again through the Advent conspiracy. The first Christmas changed the world. And now if we conspire together with our gift giving, we can change the world again. So we're inviting you to join with us in these four principles of the Advent conspiracy with many, many other churches across the globe that are participating in the same movement to worship fully, to spend less, to give more, and to love all. So worship fully means that the Advent season is our chance to, to celebrate that all this stuff is about Jesus, that this is a wondrous moment when God entered into the world to make all things right. It's a season of worship. So let's celebrate the reason for the season. Let's remember that all this stuff involved in the tradition of Christmas is ultimately points us back to Jesus who is worthy of our time, who is worthy of all our money, worthy of all our praise. That's why we're doing this whole Unwrapped series, too, is just to remember the whys behind all of our traditions that all point us back to Jesus, to remember the one who loves us so dearly. We love all these traditions, but God loves us more than we even love Christmas, which is hard for a lot of us to believe. The second thing is to spend less. You know, I, I, spend less, I'm not telling you not to buy any Christmas presents. I'm not telling you to not buy Christmas decorations. I'm not telling you to become Ebenezer Scrooge. No, far from it. As the authors of the Advent Conspiracy book write, they say, spending less does not mean spending nothing. Rather, we strive to thoughtfully evaluate what we will support with our spending and allow our spending to support products, people, and causes that are worthy of being supported. So it means we seriously consider how much stuff do I really need to buy my family members? And how much money do I really need to spend on that stuff uh, for these gifts that I'm supposed to buy? And if I sacrifice just a few small gifts, then what big gifts could I give to make a difference in other people's lives? But that last question really leads to the third principle of the Advent conspiracy, which is to give more. To give more. So when you spend less, you have more money that enables you to give more. And spending just 14 bucks less on yourself means that you could give something like a dozen baby chickens to an impoverished family. And, and those 12 baby chickens will grow and multiply and provide nourishment and income for that family for years to come. For 14 bucks. And, or for 18 bucks, you could buy a mosquito net that's big enough for an entire family to sleep under at night, and which would save them from malaria or the Zika virus or other deadly diseases. Multiple lives saved. 18 bucks or 25 bucks you can vaccinate a child from all kinds of uh, deadly diseases all for just spending a little bit less on yourself you're enabling yourself to give so much more to people who are really in need but giving more means more than just giving this stuff even to these people you can give more than just stuff because most of the time what our friends and what our family need is not just more stuff what our friends and family need most from us is more of us. So just give the gift of more of your presence. More of your presence. Presence doesn't cost a dime. It just costs you a little time. So give more. And then fourthly, love all. Don't let your Christmas gift giving be just about you and your own little group of family and friends. I know you love your kids. I know you love your spouse or your boyfriend and, and you want to spend all your money on, and all your time on, on just those people. I know it's fun to buy those people gifts. I know your family is your first and greatest priority in life, but I also know that you are called to more. When God called Abraham, he told him that he would be a blessing not just to his own family, but to many other families. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, we read, it says, The Lord had said to Abraham, to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now we know that Christ is ultimately the fulfillment of this scripture from the Old Testament. But we also know that Christ desires the same thing from us. And Christmas is this perfect time to bless other families, other families than just our own. The authors of the Advent Conspiracy book write, Christmas is our chance to move closer to those in crisis, not farther away. It's our time to notice those who are normally ignored, 
In short, it is our turn to love as we have been loved. So this Christmas season, find a way to love all and to give more beyond just your family and your friends. Conspire with us to, to something bigger than just giving to your family. Because all these traditions uh, and reasons why we give gifts, ultimately there is just one reason behind them all. We give gifts at Christmas time at, because of the reason found in John chapter 3, verse 16. You know this verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave. God gave us a gift. He gave us himself. God wrapped in swaddling cloths. God wrapped in flesh and lying in a manger. God gave us his physical presence here on earth. God gave because God loves us all. We give because we love all. We were once not a part of God's family, but God reached out to us and gave us his love and his presence. We give presents because God gave us his presence. And we want all the world to know God's love and his presence here with us. God gave because God loved, and the gift of God's love changed the world in that very first Christmas. And it can change the world again through our giving. So this Christmas, let's change the world again. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son, God made flesh, the very presence of God here on earth. Thank you for your generosity toward us, the people who were once not your family, who are not your children, but you have made us your family. You've made us your children by reaching out and giving the gift of your presence and your love and your forgiveness to us by your grace. So thank you, God. And God, this Advent season, give us that same spirit of generosity inside of us so that we can join with you on your mission to change the world by your grace once again. And God, if there are any here today that have yet to receive the gift of your love, yet to receive the gift of your grace and your salvation. And I ask that your spirit would speak to their hearts now, that you would touch them right now in this place, and you would invite them to receive that gift of new life today. And if you are here today, if any one of you are here today, and you're ready to receive that gift of God's love and grace, then just pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Today I receive your love. I receive your gift of salvation. I trust you as Lord. Please fill me with your spirit that I may live for you. In Jesus' name.